order, Monday, October 11th at 7 p.m. Would you like to call the roll? Chair Moore? Here. Alder Goforth? Here. Ms. Fallett? Here. Mr. DePula? Here. Mr. Homburg? Here. Mr. Stein? Here. Mr. Holmquist? Here. And it appears uh, Ms. Fox is absent. Um, don't see her on either medium at the moment. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes from September 27, 2021? So moved. Do second. I have a second? Second. Any changes, corrections? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Then it's carried. Thank you. Uh, now we'll move to number four, the appearances section. Uh, Doug, before uh, we uh, go to people that may be here on Zoom tonight, would you like to, or in the room, would you like to? Yes, I, I can share. Um, shall I share the, the written comment for the? Yep. Uh, so there were some uh, written comments that were received um, with regards to the 1208 uh, East Broadway project, uh, 5A on the, the agenda. I believe almost all of these were shared with the commission. We had a couple come in at the last minute here. Um, but the, the first was from uh, Deb Whitehorse of 1200 East Broadway. Uh, and she was um, against the project, um, given the residential nature of it, um, shared that she um, has lived adjacent to that, a fourth generation Monona resident, um, and, and has seen you know, some issues with the uh, proximate gas station, um, some police issues and, and things like that. Uh, and also talked about some of the isolation um, from the rest of the, the core of, of the community. Um, and so ultimately um, suggested not uh, this site not being used for housing, uh, but was in support of a commercial development. Um, and that full email was shared with, with the commission. Um, another one was from Keenan Fauna. Um, and this was um, in support of, of the project. Um, the housing affordability is, is, of, um, is of concern and they see that this um, is, is an opportunity to um, address the site and to, to help with some of that. Um, it appears in their, their words, um, close proximity to grocery, health, restaurants um, and retail. Um, and, and so would welcome um, the opportunity for families to join the, the community. Another was from Mary Delaney. Um, the address was not, not shared. Um, and sort of summarizing, housing in Monona um, is out of reach for many um, who would enrich the community. Um, she, she stated that um, Monona is in dire need of affordable housing um, and that this would help meet the commitment to diversity. Um, two others that came in um, late, so I just have sort of the cliff notes here. Um, Clint Keaveney of <coughs> Wallace Avenue uh, said that this would be a welcome addition and, and support of the project. And Dan Cheetak of 5108 Mesa, also in support. I believe that's all of the, the written comments that I received. Um, I'm not sure any of this have come through. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I understand we have some people uh, here this evening um, that would like to speak as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me. May, may wish to speak. Um, I first up, uh, Daniel. Please come to the podium. <coughs> Hey, good evening, everybody here, there. If you could state um, your name and address, please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Daniel Bertelson. Um, I'm, I have a business at 5320 Monona Drive. Um, uh, it's a local real estate office. And um, I guess I, I'm familiar with the project. I'm familiar with some of the people putting the project together. And I just wanted to come voice my opinion in support of it. Uh, a couple of the reasons were already suggested in writing uh, by a couple of the folks. But um, we, are, we are dealing with some pretty decent um, affordability issues, not obviously just in Monona, but, but in county in general. Um, I recently just had a couple of little stories that I want to share because my, my own personal brother just bought a house over on Maywood and it took us the better part of eight and a half months as a single person with just a single uh, middle of the road income and in reality we still bid off you know more house uh, than we would have liked to but it was um, you know, wanting to be in that proximity or, or be in the city of Monona. And um, 
you know, he's mid forties, um, college to college degrees, you know, and, and good jobs. And it was still, man, I, I can't imagine somebody else that didn't have, uh, the advantages that my brother had, um, you know, and everything else. And it was still extremely difficult. And probably the, the question of like, well, if it's not going to be residential, then, it, then, then, then we welcome all this commercial. And I just wanted to make a comment to that as well, just because I see a lot of things going on, not just locally, but nationally, when it comes to just the reuse of a lot of commercial space. Um, so to give you an idea, my company in the last 10 years, um, we downsized to tens of thousands of square feet, but we have the same size workforce. And I think that's a, that's a common theme, not only in retail uh, style businesses, but certainly service businesses and office uh, use type stuff. So we have this growing kind of fear in, in our industry of this commercial, what are we gonna do with a lot of this leftover commercial? And so whenever I see a residential project maybe not getting you know looked at or enough or whatever, I just I wanna raise support for it because we are just so far behind in, in actually creating the housing. And um, for, for what a lot of people may not understand is we've been having a hard time even keeping up with national disasters in this country. It's just, just with materials alone, getting them here uh, and everything else. And it's not looking like it's going to get better in any the next couple of years. So any project that I think can lighten uh, that burden by obviously providing some housing to some people that we need for workers. Uh, my last comment, and, and when I say workers, I mean people that aren't um, you know, later in life and maybe have their, their full-time career and their income up as high, but when they're starting out. Um, like, so my brother being, you know, in his middle age now, but 20 years ago, you know, to even with someone else to get a first-time home now, it's becoming very, very difficult. And of course, you guys are all aware there's a lot of investors buying up properties too and things like that. And so it's just making it really hard for any first-timers or any new people to come. Um, the last thing I was going to say, though, was in regards to employment and, and our actual staff. Um, we've hired four people in the last two years, and each time we had hundreds of applicants for each job, which was really great. Um, everyone we ended up hiring uh, drives here from a very long ways away, and just about every one of them, it's because they, you know, not just our job, but along with their spouses, oops, sorry, with their spouses, it's just not enough to come and be near work, um, and that just seems to be. You know, in the last 10 years that I've been hiring, um, I guess it, it seems to be more and more, I'm seeing more and more people having to drive from further and further away, and that kind of seems to defeat the purpose of getting these people closer to their jobs. And while this one seems a little isolated to me as well, um, so I do understand some of the concerns, uh, man, I looked at buying that place before we remodeled our office on Monona Drive or, or buying land there and, and building. And man, I'm just excited that somebody might finally do something there. Um, I think some of the problems that were mentioned as well may get addressed if there's more activity there and there's there's more people living there. And I think when you talk about a, as many units as that, it, that is going to be there, I'm not sure how isolated they'll be from one another, which is, you know, it's going to be a fairly, you know, big housing project and they've got everything they need there. I mean, it really is a sweet spot to be able to get in and around. And I'm not saying that it would be really nice if we get more people to walk, but for five months out of the year at least, there's a lot of people that would drive even from there down to the you know to the grocery store to get their groceries and then drive back. And then, man, is it a short drive. So um, that's all I had, and I uh, appreciate you guys letting me speak. Uh, next up, I have Ruth Ann Whitehorse. Welcome. for this opportunity. Is there a way I can take this off? Even you're six feet. You're more than six feet. I'm good. I'm okay with that. Uh, okay. I just get too hot and I I can't catch my breath. Thank you. My name's Ruth Ann Whitehorse Burns and I live in McFarland, but I'm here on behalf of Chief Auto Parts, the property that's being discussed. I've got a bit of a bit to say. This thing's been going on for so long. Um, I was, um, I'm here to support North Point's development plan on the White Horse Chief Auto Park properties. I have vested interest because it's my family's properties and that's been on the market for over 10 years. I was really frustrated after reading the September 23rd housing complex article in the Herald Independent because the same old issues keep coming up, location and residential. 
So some history again, some of you have already heard this, but back in 2014, we had a company and a guy by the name Kevin Newell of Royal Capital place an offer on the purchase of the property under Whitehorse Properties, which is owned by my father, Walter Whitehorse, who is now 95 years old, still lives in his home. He's a World War II vet and he's a, a Ho-Chunk tribal member. The intent was to have 68 residential units. This housing was not intended as low income housing, but for working professionals and young families seeking quality and affordable housing in a live, work, play environment. That was Kevin's explanation. There were also 20 units reserved for veterans. So instead of giving Kevin a thumbs up or down, the commission stated that if he wanted to build housing, he would also need to develop Chief Auto Parts property, the larger part. So my father owns the smaller acreage, which was just under three acres under White Horse Properties. My two brothers own Chief Auto Parts. There were two separate properties. <clears throat> Kevin just wanted to buy my father's piece of property which is less than three acres, but the commission demanded that he purchase and develop the whole eight acres of the two joint properties. What I can't figure out is how the commission could require Kevin to purchase the adjacent property. It must be because both properties had the white horse name attached to it. The two pieces of property were, were owned by two separate entities, white horse properties and chief auto parts. If it were two separate properties owned by Mr. Homburg and Smith, could you then force the developer to buy both properties if he just wanted to just purchase Homburg's properties? Would you force Smith to sell the property? Probably not. I think because of the name of Whitehorse and his families, I think that's what Kevin was pressured into, having to develop the whole piece of property. Um, so Kevin had to go back to the drawing board, find other uses for the land, look for businesses, investors, etc. Monona wanted retail or hotel on the property, which would be great, but it wasn't happening. Again, Kevin presented revised plans to include business buildings, and the commission, planning commission, want, required that they <clears throat> kept wanting to. I'm sorry. Again, Kevin presented revised plans to include business buildings that the commission required, and they kept wanting to tweak those plans. The commission would pick apart the aesthetics or lack of and send him on his way. Some of those aesthetics were there's not enough brick on the front of the building on these beautiful plans that he provided. Um, the door isn't big enough. Those were the little things that came back to him. Now, when I looked at Trasta, I did my own research. Trasta had the same size door, had just brick on the lower level. So I don't get that. Um, Kevin spent over one and a half years pulling this together and still not getting a yes or no. Kevin lost out over $100,000 of WIDA money because of the deadline had expired. And not to uh, also on account for the money he lost just in the architecture, his engineers, and the money that he had to give us to hold the property. <clears throat> Kevin went back and forth with the Planning Commission so many times that he finally decided he couldn't follow through and did not renew the contract with Whitehorse Properties or with Chief Auto Parts as of November 2015. It all fell through. This whole process was very stressful on the parties involved, however, probably not Monona. Kevin presented it as affordable housing, and I think that is what scared the Planning Commission at that time. Um, to shut it, and so they shut down the plan. You know the stigma that's attached to affordable housing, even though you can't come out and say it. Monona is a liberal city. Shouldn't it welcome affordable housing? I really felt that Kevin had a good case of racial discrimination. He's black, along with his assistant. They kept going back and forth. <clears throat> I went to see Sonia Reichert, who was the city planner at that time. 
after the last planning commission meeting with Kevin and asked her what the city wanted. Well, she said that they don't want residential or any kind of housing, low income or senior living. They said the location is not good for people having to walk to the grocery store, restaurants or pharmacy. Plus there is no bus route. So why didn't the planning commission come right out and say that they didn't want residential and save Kevin time and money spent on this project along with the stress for him and my family. They just kept stringing him along and moving the goalposts further. And I was at a lot of those meetings myself and saw that happen. There has since been apartments developed along the Yahara River on the West Broadway between Monona Drive and Bridge Road, which I believe is called The Current um, by the Yacht Club and whatever. That was a debacle in itself too. That location is approx approximately the same distance, 0.7 miles from the intersection of Monona Drive and Broadway where Pier 37 is located with various businesses such as pick and save, grocery store, you've got, yeah, the, you know, Staples, credit union. Um, it's the same distance going from Chief Auto Parts to Pier 37, 0.7 miles with sidewalks. Well, I measured out that distance and it is the same. This is, there is a sidewalk on the same side as Chief Auto Parts that goes all the way down Broadway past Pier 37. There also is a Huska Park, which um, contains tennis courts and green space, and during the summer it offers farmer's market on Sundays. This location is on East Broadway and very close to Chief Auto Parts. <clears throat> now I'd like to address the article I mentioned at the beginning. Can someone tell me where downtown Monona is? There isn't one. I grew up on Chief Auto Parts property when I was a born and up to kindergarten age, through kindergarten. There was nothing around. It was all grassland. In fact, some uh, my dad and his family, they would, <clears throat> on the spot where Yahara Clinic is and even down further, in the summer they, were, they would put a teepee up and they would also sell their baskets and stuff. My dad had to go out and sell that. Um, there really isn't a downtown. The city stretches all along Monona Drive and Broadway. So why is it so important that these apartments be within a so-called usual neighborhood? Why is the location bad? Monona is spread out. Plus where else is there to build affordable housing that the commission was keen on as stated in the news article? And Mr. Holmquist, I'd like to say something for you. I know you don't like you don't like um, the location being near two highways. You may live in an uh, usual neighborhood, but it's really nobody can say where somebody should and should not live. That's a person's choice. You also mentioned um, how much more connection or um, uh, um, also, how much more connection to the rest of the city do you want? Crossing Highway 51 to get to the nearest bus stop shouldn't be an issue. People have cars. Isn't that why the commission is requiring a certain amount of parking space? And it's pretty significant. There's also Uber, taxi cabs, friends and family members for most people to get around. That statement really, to me, is putting a stigma on the residents that you're expecting to live there. <clears throat> when my father lived on Chief Auto Parts property, while he was a child, he was six years old, he and his mom, my grandma, walked to Nichols School each month to collect government food subsidies and then walked back home in all types of weather. I think people can walk to Madison Metro or the Pick and Save, I don't even know what it's called now, and or to the restaurants on Broadway. Things are within walking distance. I think we're just maybe getting too lazy. And Mr. Homburg, at one of the meetings with Kevin Newell, you said, who would want to live there? I wouldn't want to live there. And I know you said that because I wrote it down. So I'm asking you, 
Who is asking you to live there? Nobody's asking you to live there. You state in the news article that it's a bad place to stick 75 families and basically in that location. No one is sticking 75 families in these apartments against their will. It's a personal choice as to where people want to live. And to state that living within walking distance of local job of local jobs does not necessarily make the project a conducive place to live, it's a ridiculous statement. Having a good job, having a job is good. It's good to earn money, to pay for rent, to buy food, to support your family, and living close to your job is even more advantageous. So a lot of people downtown Madison, when I worked for this state, a lot of people lived in those uh, condos downtown because they could walk right there. So that's an advantage. There is a housing shortage around the Madison area. There are apartments going up all over the suburbs. There's some in McFarland, some in Oregon. Um, you can bet that the apartments that North Point builds will fill up. Um, when I went to Monona's website, I word searched diversity and found the official statement on diversity, equity, and inclusion as of April 19th, 2021. And it states, the city of Monona is committed to welcoming all people, regardless of their race, age, sexual orientation, gender, identity, or ability, and foster a sense of belonging and opportunity across our community and among our staff. Together we strive to remove barriers to living, working, and thriving in our city because we believe that diverse perspectives make Monona a great place to visit and call home. <clears throat> it appears, this is getting right to the heart of it with my family, but it appears that Monona has been discriminatory against Kevin Newell, who is black, and along with his assistant, and the White Horse family, who are Native American, along with bias towards affordable housing. Since Chief Auto Parts opened its business in 1948, the city of Monona has never supported the business. They neither brought their vehicles for repair or painting or purchased any auto parts, leaving distinct impression that the city didn't even want us there. We were pretty much the first recycling center. We recycled car parts. We recycled cars before you even had the so-called recycling of plastics and everything. So instead, Monona tolerated us. I guess we tolerated Monona. Um, so my, my father has had, a de had to deal with discrimination his whole life because he's Native American. It never ends. When he, in the 60s, uh, early 60s, I remember my mom and he would always have, have dinner at night, and I always asked him, how come you guys don't go out to eat? I didn't ask him at that time. I didn't ask him until I was an adult. And my mom said, because they wouldn't serve us a lot of restaurants. There was just a few that would. Toby's and I think Dutch Mill Inn or something. So Monona takes pride in being progressive, inclusive, and diverse, but I beg to differ on how the sale of our property has been handled since 2014. So that's all I have to say, say which you're probably grateful for, and I thank you. Thank you. Anybody else here to make an appearance related to anything on the agenda, this, or not on the agenda even this evening? Anybody online uh, that would like to speak? We have one more. <clears throat> sure. never requested, but I don't see them online. Okay. Uh, there was an Ann. There's somebody that's trashing. Trash. There is somebody. somebody is that a person? Like hmm? Rob, J Rob Dickey just joined. Rob Dickey, are, are you interested in speaking, or are you here to listen in? I'm just here to listen in. Thanks. Okay. Great. Um, not seeing anyone else uh, on the screen uh, this evening to speak. I will close the appearance section. Um, and we're going to move uh, to new business. Um, uh, the the folks um, from North Point are, are uh, 
are tied up um, in, in another meeting at the moment, right across the hall, actually. Uh, and and uh, we thought it would be a good idea to, to let those other folks on the agenda that have, might have shorter, uh, um, a shorter visit here uh, go first anyway. So we're going to move right to number six in new business, uh, at 6A in particular, public hearing on a request by Walmart represented by SGA Design Group for approval of zoning permit to order pickup modifications and store renovations at 2151 Royal Avenue, case number 2-0252021. Does someone uh, here to speak uh, on behalf of this public hearing? My name is Sunday Boer. Um, I'm with STA Design Group. We're the architectural consultants for Walmart. Terrific. And and um, as mentioned in our package uh, for the zoning permit certificate, um, we are looking to relocate the online grocery pickup service to the exterior parking. Um, this past year, it's been in the underground parking. Um, but what we're doing is an interior remodel um, in the store that is, it's an area that's going to be sectioned off exclusively for the online grocery pickup service. Now, before the pandemic, um, online orders took up 15%, made up 15% of Walmart sales. Since the pandemic, um, they just released these numbers this past week. Um, they're realizing a 97% increase on online sales. So in order to accommodate that, meet the needs and, you know, um, not impact the interior sales, they're sectioning off the, the interior portion of the building where they will marshal the orders and we're going to use the surface parking um, to where they will be going to pick up the groceries. Um, in that process, um, they will be widening um, the parking stalls um, primarily to allow the associates um, safe access around the buildings. Um, the model that, that we presented in our package um, anticipates that they can meet up to a thousand orders a day and you know they're on the online ordering system if any of you haven't used it yet um, you schedule a time frame a one hour time frame that um, represents about 84 um, orders an hour and the the transaction a lot of time is 10 minutes um, that we're seeing that you know orders are processed in four to five minutes, so it's not any change in the traffic patterns to the the surface parking. It's just you know trying to to meet the service. And in addition to that, they are wanting to update the, the store colors. You know um, the earth tone is a little dated and there's the big rush with the, the neutral tones and so we've also included that in our package. Okay. Great. Thank you. Is there anyone else here that would like to uh, speak on this particular Walmart proposal before I close the public hearing? Okay. Uh, with that, I'll close uh, the public hearing. Uh, I thank you for uh, your presentation um, and I'll move to new business uh, consideration of action on the request by Walmart uh, represented by the SGA design group for approval of the zoning permit for order pickup modifications and store renovations at 2151 Royal Avenue case number 2-025-2021 Doug Thank you uh, so just as a as an overview here this is a zoning permit request uh, for the order pickup and store renovations uh, the property is zoned community design district cdd um, and this zoning permit request requires plan commission review the pickup modifications uh, result in a net reduction of eight parking stalls taking it down from 770 to 762 
uh, which staff feels is still more than adequate for the, for the needs of, of that site. Uh, it includes a new crosswalk and entry exit for the, um, for the water pickup. It's quite discreet. It was included in the, in the materials um, and, and is really more of a service door than, than a, a large entryway. Um, the exterior colors, the gray tones, and signage, which is a secondary part, are also proposed. With that, uh, staff recommendation uh, is approval uh, with the two conditions of approval as listed in the staff report. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, with that, uh, I will uh, begin committee deliberations. Um, Chris, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I think we're not talking about science right now, just the use. And as far as the use go, I goes, I think it's fine. I think. Um, the parking stalls there will be fine. Actually, with this pickup service, there will probably be less people staying in the store as long, so it will probably be advantageous. Uh, the one comment I would have when I was there, Doug, maybe take a look. Uh, there's a lot of tree islands without trees in them anymore. So it's something we should catch up on. Sure. Okay. Great. Corrine? I like it as well. It'll be way better than what you have now for the pickup. I drove around and, and looked for that, and I think this will be a lot more accessible and easier for your employees to get access to the vehicles as well. So I think it's great. Okay. Thank you. Patrick? Uh, I've got nothing to add. I think okay. it's fine. Okay. I, I will mention, I will concur with uh, uh, with Mr. Homburg about the, the islands without trees, though. Okay. You know, especially with all that property tax money there's a... Okay. Okay. Christy? Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm excited to see it get a little bit of a facelift, a little nip and tuck, if you will. Um, I think that'll be great. Um, I see no issues with this, and it's you know nice to see you adapting to the times. And um, I think it's a, a well thought out plan. Thank you, uh, Rob. I'm Dan. I think that's good. Fine improvement. Okay, Brian. I have no concerns. It looks good. Okay. <clears throat> With that, do I have a motion? That's okay. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. That's all right. Okay, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Susan. No problem. I have nothing to add. Okay. And I think it makes a lot of sense, so I'm glad to see it, actually. Looks good. Okay. Great. Great. Okay. Now I'll entertain a motion. I'll, I'll move the conditions as written by staff. Great. Do second. I have a second? Second. I've got a second for mm -hmm. Patrick. Okay. Great. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The motion carries. Uh, next up is a public hearing on the request by Walmart represented by SGA Design Group for new signage at 2151 Royal Avenue, case number S0202021. Once again, uh, you're up. First, uh, feel free to present on the signage if you would. Okay, um, in regards to the signage, um, it's in line with the, their, their new branding image. Um, believe it or not, I believe the signs are less than square footage, uh, just a more contemporary feel. Um, I'll just say, uh, some of the words are being changed. They've gone from grocery to market or it's just basically an update. The, the font is a little different. Um, and we will be, of course, also incorporating uh, some side signage uh, for the online grocery pickup service for designated parking spots. I believe that was also included in our package too. Um, but it's typical. Walmart signage, um, the three main ID signs, no, two of the main ID signs will be eliminated and the rest are all just, you know, uh, channel letters, not eliminated. Okay, great. Is that it for your presentation? Okay. Um, uh, is there anybody else that wants to speak at the public hearing portion or at signage? Okay, uh, not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing and we'll move to 6D, consideration of action on the request by Walmart represented by SGA Group for new signage at 2151 Royal Avenue, case number S-020-2021.
Doug? Thank you. Uh, so for the building here, the, the new signage, um, obviously part of the <coughs> exterior upgrades um, and the water pickup uh, coordination as well. A comprehensive sign plan does exist for the building, uh, which was included in the, the packet for, for reference. This is a departure from the, the comprehensive sign plan, specifically the order pickup elements, um, the on-site directional as they would be classified uh, under the new sign code. A um, couple things to point out here. Uh, it would be new wall signage, new on-site directional, as well as it's listed, the, the pylon signage, although the artwork is not specifically included. Uh, it does show a net reduction um, in, in sign area. A lot of this uh, owes to the, the background color being used, um, very similar to how some of the stores at Pier 37, including Staples, have, have utilized that with the blue um, here for, for the brand color. Um, a couple items uh, recommended for discussion here would be the on-site directional signs for, for pickup. They do appear to be um, larger than would be allowed by the, the, the current sign code. Um, and the, the graphics and the um, elements shown here are a little bit blurry as well. So that may be something um, for the staff to review, um, but just the, the elements look functional in themselves, but I think just some discussion of a possible exception uh, and just some housekeeping on that. Also noted uh, was the temporary banner um, as, as a part of this. I believe during the removal of the, the main wall signs, um, some of the notes here on one of the sheets listed that 125 square foot banner would be uh, located in, on a temporary basis, uh, and that would be in excess, again, of, of the temporary signage uh, that would be allowed, so just something else to, to discuss. So with those items, um, if, if the commission is satisfied with those, uh, staff does recommend approval. Uh, there's a finding of facts included, as well as uh, a couple of recommended conditions for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Brian, would you like to start us off on this one? Sure. Um, my first question is actually probably for Doug, and that has to do with um, our signage for um, pickup stalls. I don't know a better way to say it, but like online ordering pickup stalls. Uh, is that something that we reference in our sign code? Because I'm not sure if other entities have necessarily applied for a, a permit regarding those, those signs. So I think in terms of the, the definition, um, on-site directional would probably, um, in the, the current sign code, would, would be the most um, applicable element to use for that, uh, which if I recall is four square feet in um, area, but also four feet ma uh, maximum mounted height. Uh, there have been one or two instances of one or two pickup or um, collection sites being included. Uh, I believe Traster or the, um, the retail establishments that there uh, at the former Traster building um, were approved administratively rather than you know coming through just separate just for that item uh, but the square footage was less um, but I I think if it were to be uh, categorized it would be um, on-site directional okay yeah and I, I only bring that up not necessarily in direct reference to this but it, it, uh, this applicant I think has a variety of signs in it and uh, I think this is one of the uh, first sign packages that I think we review where there's a reduction in signs and a reduction in, in size, which is uh, great to see. And I actually it, um, like to see the, the changeover of using the background uh, of a building to its like best capacity to be able to be included for that color, that color aspect. Um, I, I did not have any other major items highlighted, so I'm good to go. Okay, great. Thank you, Brian. Rob? Yeah, in general, I think um, all the proposed signs are appropriate for this building. Um, I think it goes along with kind of the overall improvements that you're trying to make. Um, it's the middle of a little um, confusing, but I think I've been following everything. I don't really have an issue with um, them trying to kind of state their brand a little bit more, obviously. Um, and there's still a lot of brick, and I don't think it's going overboard. Um, as far as the wayfinding, on-site wayfinding, if it's gonna help circulation and safety, I'm for that. And as far as the banner goes, um, a big building 
Um, if it's temporary, I'm not overly concerned with a temporary banner, um, so long as it's not there for too long. But all my comments. Okay. Great. Thank you. Susan. Um, I would agree with Rob's thought about the temporary banner. I had the same thought. I, I think overall it makes sense. It looks good. And I think the updating also looks nice. So I, I really don't have any problems with it. Um, I guess the only thing that I still maybe that we should talk about is the size of the directional signs. I, so it's four, four square feet, which is pretty large. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure they need to be that large, but um, we could have more conversation about that, I guess. And uh, yeah, that's all. Otherwise, I, I like it. I think it looks good. Great. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Patrick. I've got nothing to add. Okay. Corey. Um, I my I guess my biggest question was the pickup signs. It just seems huge to have the number and then the phone number and then the giant sign that says pick up and I, I guess I'm I'm not sure it what that number actually is how big it actually is and if it fits into that on outside directional um, I see that that's how Walmart has it now for the pickup it it's just huge though and I think if it's on the surface lot and you have how many of them are there 20 of them I can't remember how many there were um, it's going to be pretty obvious what that's for. I don't know that you need the extra pickup. Maybe pickup can be incorporated into the number pickup number one or something with the sign with the. I mean, it doesn't. It's just a suggestion. It seems like a lot, and I think it's going to be a lot in the in the parking lot. But as far as the rest of it, I think it looks good and makes sense. And. Um, oh, I did have one other question. I don't know if you know the answer to this or not, but I was just curious if how the automotive part works. Do people call and get an appointment at bay number four and then they go to bay number four? Is that why there's going to be numbers at those different bays? Um, no, um, they don't make appointments for the, the tire loop express. Um, I'm not really sure why they put numbers on them, um, unless you know when they are met by the the staff that they're told to pull into the next available bay, and they give it they designated a number. I'm not really sure. Yeah, I guess that would be a question just to find out is what's the purpose of a number if if it is something that they need. You know that, that I think it makes sense, but if not, they don't need that. Thank you. Uh, Kristen? Um, yeah, I, I really have no issues with any of this. Um, the temporary banner, it seems necessary and needed while you're um, making that change out. Um, yeah, no problems for me. Yeah. And Chris? Um, I agree with the comments on the, well, first, the overall signage I think looks fine. Um, it's a big building. But I agree with the comments on the directional sign. It's just too tall. It's hard to read. I, I mean, it's really blurry. But is it say it's 51 inches? 51 inches? I'm, I, I can't even read it. But our, our code is four feet, and I see no reason why it needs to be over four foot tall. When you're going to have 22, is it? Mm -hmm. Of these signs sitting there, I don't see why they need to exceed our, our code on that. As far as square footage, Doug, isn't our code two square feet? I thought it was four foot high and two square feet. I would have to check. Okay. I, I thought that's what it was. Uh, and maybe we change it when we recodify it. Um, I wouldn't be adverse. It's, it's about one foot wide. So if we get down to four feet and it ends up being four by three or something, I don't think that would be horrible. But I don't think it needs to be whatever they're, whatever they're showing. Uh, it's hard for me to tell. Do you know how high the signs are? How tall they are? I'm asking the applicant. Yes. The, the signs are six feet. Now, yeah. technically, there are 22 uh, online grocery pickup service spaces that we're designating, but and technically, we are doing 22 signs, but they're front and back to one another. So there would be 11 posts that would have a front and back sign. 
They they total at, um, I believe, seven and a half square feet when you add up all of the signage together that's stacked. And believe it or not, that there are actually people that don't have smartphones that utilize the pickup service that they have to they have to dial in the phone number to let us know that they're there. Um, but the, the the logic of it is is you know so people clearly understand that that those spots are reserved for pickup. And you know the height and all that sort of stuff is for you know some of the larger vehicles that are out there these days that you know we want to get them there too. And while I've got you, while I've got this open, um, very seldom do they use the banner when they're replacing the signage. Normally, it's like a one-day event. They've gotten very efficient on it. I really think that 125 square foot banner is a very old note, but it's been my experience. I'm going to say for the past 15 years that they go in, they replace it, and it's. They, they normally don't use that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I see no reason to have six foot tall directional signs there. When you're pulling into a stall, you don't need it six foot tall to see it, um, and especially if so many of them are right. Green Corrine, it would be quite the mess. Uh, there's no reason for it. Right. right. Okay. Uh, that being the case, um, perhaps uh, we could entertain a motion where where that would I'll, um, I'll move uh, approval with the finding of fact is written by staff conditions one through three is written by staff condition mm -hmm. four that the directional signage be limited to four foot maximum height and condition five that staff and the applicant work out the necessity of having numbers on the uh, car bait or the auto base door doors You got that? Yes. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. Any other discussion? Is that yeah. Yeah. Take care of your concern? Yep. Okay. okay. Just to, to clarify for, for point four, the directional sign being four feet, mm -hmm. four foot maximum height and an and accompanying uh, decrease in signage. Would that be? We'll, we'll get a natural decrease. I, I don't think anybody has issue with it being one foot wide. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there, it'll be smaller, but it will it will likely exceed our two foot standard. But in, in that configuration, I'm okay with it. If everybody else is, it just might end up being three square feet or something like that. You know, Thank you. Off, but, but I believe it gives the applicant plenty of room to get the information out there they need, and it will be repeated many many times. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Great. I have a motion. And I have a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, and that takes us to um, thank you, um, Walmart uh, and SGA. Um, that takes us to consideration of 6E, public hearing on a request by RMR Financial, represented by La Crosse Sign Group for new signage at 400 Interlake Drive, case number S-021-2021. Welcome. If you could state your, uh, come up to the podium here and state your name uh, and affiliation and delighted to listen. Good evening, my name is Bill Rupp and I'm with the Cross Sign Company here in Madison. And uh, as in packet, I am propo we're proposing for RMR new signage on the south elevation of their building that faces the Belton Highway. Um, so I'm here for any questions that you may have. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else here to speak on this particular public hearing? Okay. Hearing none, we'll, we'll close uh, the public hearing and open uh, new business 6A, oh, sorry, 6F, uh, public hearing on the request. Sorry, we have two public hearings. Do you mean consideration of action? Yes. Sorry. Okay. 
Uh, consideration of action on the request by RNMR Financial, represented by La Crosse Sign Group for new signage at 400 Interlay, case number S-2, sorry, S-02120221. So this, again, is the consideration of action on, on, uh, on this request. Doug? Thank you. So this uh, request is for a new wall sign um, for RMR Wealth Advisors, uh, nearly 73 square feet, um, uh, aluminum cabinet, uh, acrylic backed, uh, internally illuminated sign, um, facing south towards both the Yahara River and the Beltline. Um, as mentioned in the staff report, it's actually a pretty difficult building to measure um, with its design as, as well as lo location at the end of the street, uh, also abutting um, the the Yohara River. Uh, the current wall sign, the only uh, wall sign that was included in this packet is for one of the other tenants of the building at 24 square feet. Uh, and there's an approximately 52 square foot uh, monument ground sign as well. There is one um, small existing RMR wall sign um, that is included. Um, it's actually beneath uh, one of the canopies, um, much smaller. Uh, and I think you know, staff recommendation is, is for there to be some discussion as to whether maybe that is, is replaced uh, if this new wall sign uh, does, uh, is approved. Um, and so the, the city sign code does allow for additional signage uh, for facades that face one or more streets um, or the channel. Uh, so I think some of the discussion would be the orientation of the building and, and the face uh, as to whether this is, you know, a frontage um, or if it is a, a back or a, um, more of a, an access point for the building. Um, the size does appear appropriate um, and it falls in total uh, between the three, uh, the two wall signs as well as the monument sign falls within 150 square feet uh, signage um, for, for the whole building. Uh, but I think discussion of the southern face of the building is, is uh, would be advisable. Um, if the commission is comfortable with that, uh, staff recommends approval uh, with both the finding of fact and conditions of approval um, as stated in the staff report. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, would you like to start this one? Sure. Um, I think the sign's way too big for the facade that's been put on. I think it's kind of obvious when you look at it. And when we look at our calculations, uh, you don't ring a building and say you've got facade on all these sides and use that for a number. You use the number for the facade it's on. And so for this facade, it's depending on how you want to do it, it's anywhere from 27 to 32 feet. So I, I think 32 feet is, would look a lot better on there. The thing about this um, elevation is it, we never meant for any building signage to be able to be a, a billboard or viewable from the belt line. You know, if somebody's coming in by boat, you know, they'd be able to see a, a normal size sign. Uh, the other sign they have there, we don't have a picture in our packet. It's it's very tasteful. It's right by the front door. It tells people where to walk in. I think it's great. And I think we certainly have precedent and reason to be, be able to allow a second sign for this customer since they do front right on the Har River, which we've done before. So I don't have any issues with putting the second sign on. My issue is it's so big. And it, and it, I mean, when you look at your drawing, it looks like it's a billboard on the end of a building. So I would recommend we keep to within our code, which would be a, a max of 32 square feet. You both have a little less than half the size of the code. Okay. Be very viewable from any bolts coming in. It just you might not see it from the belt line. Okay. Thank you. Marie? I had, um, yeah, that would okay. be great. Thank you. You can't actually Oh, we can't. can't. That's yeah, right. We can't. Fire so oh, so sorry. Sorry. <laughs> That's why I hesitated. Yeah, <laughs> I forgot. Thanks. Um, I had the I had the same the same thoughts, and you know it. It just seemed like they were trying to have it read from the belt line, which may not have been the intent, but it's it's pretty vague. My other question was: it's since it's just for clarification or for future reference, because those two businesses are in the same building, does Portal Media also count as having frontage on the river since they're in the same building? If I, I, I think it's always hard to do these sign things. So if I could take a stab at it, from what I can see from the footprint of the building, the um, RM who, what? RMR. Thank you, RMR. I just, those acronyms. <laughs> RMR really has the frontage there. So, so when okay. you look at a building frontage, you remember even on some of our other strip centers, we take the frontage of that 
particular business and use it, except for in extreme cases where we allow one to say, well, you've got a little less frontage and this business is going to let you take some of theirs, so you can get a sign that people can see. But if I were to interpret it, that end, I believe, is all RMR, and so that's okay. their frontage, and that's their business. We don't usually let somebody else come and have off-premise almost signage on a different end. Okay. Is that? Yeah, I was just wondering, because I didn't know if then Portal Media would want to come and have a sign put there, too, and if we'd want to consider how to fit both, but that makes sense. They get pretty this small, because you're still limited to the 32 square feet. Yeah. So... Those are my only comments and questions. Okay. Um, I agree with Mr. Humbert. It's, I think it's too big. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's, it's got to be smaller. Christine? Um, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a unique site, and I understand wanting to um, take advantage of you know, the hundreds of thousands of cars that go by every day on the boat line. Um, I'm curious, though, about Waypoint and Yahara Terrace next door, which have enormous signs on them. And I'm, I'm curious, I, you know, I wasn't here when that, um, I wasn't on the plan commission when those were approved. Um, can you talk to me a little about hmm. that, Doug? Because those are, I drove past, and those are way larger than this, and, and the width of that building hmm. is not that wide. And that so it, it certainly predates my time at the city, but my understanding with um, with the origin of these was that that end of the building was almost planned for, for this signage. Um, I think the signage band, is, as has been discussed on this, is, is narrower. And I, I believe that just the orientation and the architecture of that building, just given how it was designed, it seems to fit better, I think, is, is the logic and, and the reasoning behind that. But I'd certainly welcome other commission members' um, input to the, to the logic of that as well. Do you, uh, Chris, did you, do you recall? Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> I, I, I figured as much. Uh, yeah, and, and it, you're right, Christy, and it, it was a negotiation with them. They, they had the right to a lot of signage on that building. If you look mm -hmm. at the facade on that building where they could put them, and they, you know, they came back and said, we don't want to do that. All we want is this one sign facing the Ahara River, okay? And that was for Trista. Then later on, it's when Waypoint, I believe Brian, am I right? Waypoint came in afterwards, and they said, well, we really need some signage, and we won't do it here or there, but we need some on that part of the building. And that was controversial. And, and there was a lot of, uh, I, if I recall right, Brian, some spirited discussion if we need two signs on the end of that building. You know, some people felt it was too much signage. Some people felt for the scope of that building and the square footage of that building, and you look at any facade they could pick, that it was appropriate, so it, it's, a, it's a valid question. Okay. Yeah, and I, I feel like, you know, I could see the applicant thinking, oh, the precedent's been set, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm pro-sign. <laughs> I, I really have no problems with this, honestly. Um, so, yeah, I, I have no issues with it. Okay. Susan? Um, I, I pr don't really see a reason not to stick to our code on it and, do, and reduce the size. I think otherwise it looks nice. In fact, when I drove in, if anything, I thought the sign over the door could be a little larger. I mean, it's interesting because when you drive into the building, even the, it, it's nice that there is the, <coughs> the <coughs> monument sign because what you really see is portal media. So you need, you know, I, when I, you had to go back further and see, oh, yeah, that's where it is. Um, so, yeah, I... I, I can see why you'd want one there. Um, I might think about enlarging the current one too, but that's all. Okay. Um, great. Rob? Um, yeah, I think it's too big. I have no problem granting exceptions to the sign code when it's warranted, when there's a building of such mass that it, that it um, aesthetically fits. This is not. This just seems like a kind of a gross over sign building. Um, I don't mean gross as in like yucky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine with the sign. I just, I, I don't think it's, it's warranted here. So um, I'm fine with the sign, but it should be small. Okay. Brian? Yeah, overall, I agree. Like when you're showing up to the property for business, this sign is not addressing that. That consumer. Um, this sign is clearly a, an attempt to, to try to get um, 
visual for the belt line, which is not appropriate for this site. I went not only on this uh, property site to look at the location of the sign, but I also went next door to be able to see that like, where on earth it's just going to be visible from. Um, it just doesn't seem like it's it's utilizing what, what we think of for a sign to um, indicate where you are, where you want to be, and where you need to go. So way too big, I would say we can stick with our the 32 square feet on that side. Okay. Thank you. Uh, with that, do I have a, a motion to? I'll move approval. Uh, finding of fact is written by staff. Conditions one and two is written by staff. Condition three, a uh, maximum of 32 square foot for the sign. A second. We have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Oh. <laughs> I would just say nay. Oh, sorry. Uh, you got that? Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I do believe that brings us back. Unless we've got other goodies on our back. No. Uh, it brings us back to unfinished business. Uh, five. Uh, a pre-hearing conference on the request by North Point Development Corporation for consideration of a zoning permit for new construction and a new use at 1208 East Broadway, case number 2-022-2021. Welcome back. Good evening, everyone. Sorry uh, for being a little bit late. It's interesting you have to be in two places at once. We were actually in a room across the hall, um, <laughs> but in McFarland at the same time. <laughs> um, would you mind if I, let's see. Yeah, we actually we we can put it up on the Zoom meeting. Show it. I have um I have it on my computer and I've signed into the Zoom. If you want me to just share my screen that way, like we did last time. Um, either would work. Elisa can help uh, move it forward. Whichever whichever you prefer. Well, let's do that. Okay. Right. She's such a rock star. She can do anything. Yeah. <laughs> I touch this way. So no, uh, we're, we're just going to have to ask her to go to the next slide. Yep. So okay. go ahead and, um, is that Elise? I'm sorry. Yep. Elise. Elise, thank you for your help and perfect. Oh, perfect. I can control it from here then, right? Yeah. I'll go. Awesome. So well, you it, can't control it. You just got to tell her. Oh, okay. Got it. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> got to figure it out. I'll get it. Cool. Yeah. Um, first off, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are you guys doing? Good to be back again. Nice to see you again. Um, we're here back to talk about our, our development called Broadway Lofts. Uh, that we're going to propose at 1208, or approximately 1208 East Broadway. Uh, I'm going to, in the interest of time, since you guys are so nice to us, kind of go do another meeting. I'm going to keep my comments short. I'm just going to do a reintroduction because there's some um, commission members that weren't here last time we were here. Uh, my name is Lane May, representing Dreamland Real Estate. This is Sean O'Brien, representing North Point Development, and together we uh, lead and co-develop on affordable housing projects uh, in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, North Point was the uh, creation of Andy Denke and um, Callan Schultz about 10 years ago, 2010, so 12 years ago, uh, with the specific idea of addressing the affordable housing need in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, in 12 years, they did a lot of work with Sean. Sean used to spend, or spent 15 years at WIDA. Uh, the last eight of that time, he spent as the commercial lending director. So he knows this project, or these, uh, uh, the WIDA uh, 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 grant process inside out. Had a great partnership with Callan Andy. I to join on. A couple years later, I joined on, and together we are trying to add to the affordable housing stock in Dane County and along the state of Wisconsin. Um, as you can see in the map there, um, we've been doing a lot of work down in Dane County, but Wisconsin's been a, a, a definite uh, target, and we've been doing a, a really pretty good job with it. Next slide, please. Uh, at this date, in 12 years, we've managed to add just under 1,500 managed units of affordable housing throughout the state of Wisconsin. We're proud of that. I would think it's a great, great thing, especially when you're going 50 or 60 units at a time. It's an uphill battle. Um, we're very proud that we, we keep that going. Um, uh, yeah, you want to take on the yeah. site plan? Yeah. Cool. Next slide, please. So we really appreciated the discussion the last time again where we were speaking about the, the two lots uh, basically behind the Shell gas station, uh, lot four and then lot one of the, the recently uh, divided um, you know, property uh, to the west. Uh, next slide. 
And then if you zoom in, uh, the red box areas are the two lots that we're, we're talking about tonight. Uh, next slide. So we went back, um, we heard a lot of comments uh, from, uh, you know, from the commission, um, and we've taken all those comments uh, to heart and really try to incorporate that into the plan. And so what you see here is uh, uh, one of Chris's recommendations to move the stormwater basins to more of the lot line. Uh, we think that works really well. It also really um, allows for some nice backyards for all of those townhome units that we've talked about. Uh, but to kind of keep going in the direction of neighborhood, um, we wanted to make sure that there was a walking path that connected all of the tenants to the common area amenities. Um, so as you'll see, we added a walking path that will go behind the southern townhomes. Um, we do plan to have a pretty significant outdoor patio. There will be a way to access that amenity and then all of the common area amenities um, like community room, exercise room, uh, will all be located inside of the apartment building. We increased the, the play area. Um, and try to make it, you know, again, in the center of the project and added uh, a top lot structure um, just outside of uh, the uh, environmental corridor uh, where we can have uh, impervious structure. So we wanted to make sure that we could kind of kept that out of that uh, environmental corridor area. Oh, sorry. Did you keep going? Am I too? We got to get closer? Okay. Sorry about that. Can you, can you put it back on the previous slide, please? Oh, thank you. Um, and then a couple other changes, and we'll kind of cover these all in, in, in summary later. Um, we wanted to make sure that we could uh, get the right amount of parking on the site. Um, we did reach out to the Shell Station, started having that conversation about possibly purchasing uh, some of that land to kind of square off the lot. Um, that's kind of still in limbo, but what we were able to do uh, with a, a survey that we were um, able to find since the last meeting, we were able to move over the uh, environmental corridor um, a few feet on that uh, southern, southeastern side of the property. So we were able to kind of shift the building down um, a little bit more and kind of got that extra parking into the site. And it, you know, it seems to work pretty well. So again, we're, we're at the um, 135 stalls, which is the um, ordinance requirement for this, uh, this size property. Next slide. And so also, um, since the last meeting, we've done some elevations, some colored elevations, and some 3D renderings. And so we'll kind of go through these really quickly. Um, we basically wanted to show elevations that, that basically will cover all the sides of the building. I mean, our buildings are going to be wrapped um, 360 degrees with the same materials. Um, we're going to have brick uh, towards the first floor, some batten board, uh, and other uh, types of hardy plank siding. Um, along the upper three floors. A lot of variations. Um, I think it's going to be a really uh, good looking building overall. Uh, next slide. And then um, a rendering as well of the townhomes. The, all the townhomes will, excuse me, will have uh, walkout patios. Um, and again, kind of sticking with that color scheme. Um, you have uh, the front end and then the, you know, the back of the back side of those townhomes. There will be a, a flat roof on the apartment building and the pitch roofs on the, the uh, townhomes to so kind of give that variation in height, um, actually, you know, be, it would be pretty close, I think. And we've done this a couple of times, and it ends up being uh, maybe a, an eight-foot step down to the top of that uh, townhome uh, roof. Uh, next slide. And then we started getting to the, the 3D renderings. And so this is a, a view, if you were kind of looking from the belt line um, at the, the Southern 6 unit and the apartment building. Um, and I'll just say, um, out of all the buildings that we've done, this is by far my wife's favorite. Um, I don't know if that will uh, sway anyone architecturally or uh, uh, design-wise, but she loves this. So this is getting built somewhere. Um, and so it came out really, really nice. Uh, but again, all of the townhomes will have single car garages. So there'll be space for parking right behind the garage as well. Next slide. And then let's kind of go through some of these renderings. That's again the same side. It's the, you're looking from the, um, the west at the project. Next slide. Uh, this is the, the six unit townhome that's on the east side of the property. Next slide. Um, this was a really interesting view. This is a, a shot from Broadway and it kind of shows the gas station and how the property would sit behind the gas station. Um, you know, as it's kind of its own nestled in a community um, right off of Broadway. Uh, next slide. And then this is a, a main shot of the front of the building. Um, we wanted to go with, you know, the lighter blue-green colors as we're, you know, near water and, um, and also kind of keep the building light as well. Uh, next slide. 
Um, we also had a landscaping plan done. And the goal here is really to uh, kind of over landscape the site. There's a lot of nice trees and tree lines down on the site already. Um, but one of the things that you'll notice is we tried to include additional landscaping between us and the gas station, uh, in between our site and Broadway, and in between our site and the Beltline. So we've added a significant amount of trees. Um, I think if you look at the points required for the site, um, we're at about 700, and we're, we're scoring about 4,000 points. All right, now I, sorry, I don't have my reading glasses on. But we, we're about four times, we're planning for four times the, uh, the ordinance requirements for landscaping. We really think it's important. Um, I think the fact that there is so much green space here, we can do a lot to you know, improve on that and really add to it. And so this would be um, our landscaping plan that we would uh, use for the project. Next slide. Um, and just uh, a couple other details uh, for those who uh, weren't in the meeting last time. Again, we're proposing 75 total units, a mixture of buildings. Uh, between the the two townhomes and the uh, four-story apartment building, the uh, the townhomes will have um, individual parking garages. The apartment building will have um, underground parking for the tenants. Um, of the 75 units, 60 of those will be workforce housing. 15 will be market rate units, um, and nice split between one, two, and three bedrooms. Um, again, you can see that we have the on-site stormwater management taken care of. Um, you know, great backyards for the townhomes, and then we'll have the on-site amenities of the Playground, patio, picnic area, grill station, et cetera, that we put into our projects. Um, if I jump down to the bottom right, um, one thing that I do want to highlight, since this last meeting, uh, we were notified by the county that they will be awarding $1.25 million of their Dane County Affordable Housing Funds to the project. Um, in terms of where does that stand, uh, it has to go to the county board. And basically, it's a, a rubber stamp approval that this is the, the recommendation of the committee that reviewed all the applications. And then we have to obviously go to WIDA and get our tax credits in order for the project to move forward. So our commitment will be conditioned on the WIDA tax credits, but they have made a commitment to the project um, to support uh, the affordable housing at this site. A couple of things that uh, come along with that. Uh, not only will we already be doing Wisconsin Rebuilt Homes certification, but the requirement of the Dan County funds include Energy Star certification and EPA Indoor Air Plus certifications as well. So they really are pushing for that sustainable um, design, green built design with their awards. Um, we will have on-site management, controlled entry, um, and um, again, we estimate the project to be approximately $19 million in total development costs. Although if you ask me that in a week, it may be 20 million, um, the way things are, are going these days. Um, and estimated annual taxes um, are going to be approximately 125,000 based on the income approach of the affordable housing project. So. Um, quite a substantial uh, increase in property taxes to the city um, over uh, the current assessment. Next slide. Oops, sorry, next slide, please, Elise. Do we? Oh, go ahead. Where's the timeline? Did, oh, yeah, there, there might be. You might have skipped two, one. Okay, there we go. Um, right there. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, really quickly, again, workforce housing. It just means that's housing that's priced affordably to work, you know, the workforce in the area. Um, we then tend to apply for the 9% low income housing tax credits from WIDA. If we are awarded those credits, they're sold to an investor. And that, that investment then becomes the equity for the project. And in return for that equity, uh, we guarantee to keep those 60 units um, at affordable level, levels for a period of 30 years. Um, actually, the county requires 35 years, so they kind of ask for a couple extra years. But um, we are required to keep those six units uh, at affordable levels. And a majority of this project will be targeted to um, households earning 50 to 60 percent of the county median income, uh, meaning you know, 40 to 50,000 for a two person household or 48 to 60,000 uh, for a four person household. Um, really quickly through the, the timeline, um, we're, we're looking for uh, basically GDP approval by December so we can apply for the tax credits. Um, and then uh, WIDA would announce in April. Um, and if we are awarded in April, we'd come back for our, our final approvals and hopefully start construction uh, in October of uh, next year. And then next slide. So uh, based on our last meeting, we took some of the feedback. As you can see, Sean, uh, with the um, site plan and elevation plan, we took your feedback and kind of in, uh, inputted that and leveraged it. I wanted to take a different approach and just kind of go down that site and see um, 
based on the comments that it was isolated. And I get it. You're right. We hear you. We hear you exactly what you're saying. And yet I kind of want to focus on what was there. What does that place have to offer if it doesn't have um, other homes or, or single family around it? And I just took a simple walk. I think uh, they sent a video to you that I took. I don't know if you watched it or not, but if you get on that east side of the property, that last uh, view we had with the a shell station here and the development to the right, and you walk, I'm a big guy with a cup of coffee and a selfie stick, 14 minutes, you're at the corner of Broadway and Monona. And between Broadway and Monona, you run into, um, the first thing you run into is health. So there's a hospital or a clinic uh, right next door, two minutes away. There's also one right across the street. I was there three different times over two different days, all generally around the 10 to 3 space, and there was ample time that I could cross Broadway very easily and go to Denny's or Menard's. I'm not even going to focus on those because I wanted to stay on the side of the street, but I was really, sorry, I was really, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm just going to hold this. I'm just gonna, um, I was really, I was surprised at how the street is busy and yet still very navigable. Um, and then obviously you get to the corner, you've got a protected cross, uh, a protected crossway around Broadway at the corner there. So medical, got that within two minutes. Uh, health, GNC, oh, not health. Um, trying to find the first ones you get to by my memory here. Oh, um, the, the first shopping center, you got the uh, Tower Inn, Missy Moo's uh, Laundry, Car Wash, uh, Hanson's Chimney, there's a, a, a animal care or a veterinarian. Um, Hoosa Park is beautiful, as you all know, and it offers a farmer's market. That's a six minute walk from where this would be. Um, by the time you get down to Pier 37, uh, next slide please, you run into uh, UW Crate Union, so you've got banking. Uh, you got banking, sorry, thanks. You've got banking, you've got uh, healthy retail, you've got grocery, um, all the restaurants you could ever think of. I mean, literally, your palate cannot favor all the restaurants that are in that shopping center. So I kind of want to just ask, you know, why not? Um, why not this development? Because there's so many things it does have to offer. I understand what it doesn't have to offer, but I think you can tell by the elevation plan that Sean showed you earlier. We've kind of thought this through. Um, with the waterway that's there, the Beltline, I think we can make it a very, very beautiful development. I know we can make it a very, very beautiful development. It'll be very attractive to many people. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all I had. Do you want me to cover the last? Can we just have a couple more quick slides? Yeah, some more slides. Next slide, please. Um, one other thing that came up in the last meeting uh, was, you know, kind of posing the question, you know, Beltline goes a pretty long way through Dane County. You know, where else in Dane County is there housing that isn't in a residential area? And actually, there's more and more housing coming in areas just like this. Um, one that's already been built and is uh, open and ready for occupancy is the Urbana at 5577 Odana Road. And <clears throat> this property, as you're driving to the mall, um, it's kind of just popped out of the middle of nowhere, uh, right behind the Y. And so, you know, um, that has, has come in, and this is pretty much the same, I would say. It's about 300 feet away from the Beltline. It's a luxury market rate property uh, that's uh, across the street from Laredo's, um, those who are uh, familiar with kind of the uh, Odana area. Um, I know you can't really see the picture on the lower right um, because of the, the sidebar there, um, but you know you can get the, the idea. It's, it's right off of, um, I believe that's Whitney Way and Odana Road, right on the corner. Um, and if you were to take a look at the Odana area plan that Madison just published, that whole section of Madison is, you know, uh, employment center, retail, heavily retail, and they're calling for mixed use all the way along Odana Road. And so uh, Madison as a community is, is really taking um, older retail and trying to fill it in with newer uses uh, that are in close proximity to um, amenities, jobs, um, you know, that sort of thing. And <clears throat> next slide. And then also, if you were to take a look at the Stoughton Road revitalization plan, um, I think what you would see is uh, there's a desire to bring more down Stoughton Road towards Broadway uh, from Madison. It's kind of starting already with the Starbucks and the Youngblood Brewery, um, but as things start to continue to come down Stoughton Road, you're going to see that as an area for redevelopment. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then lastly, um, again, I, I'm sorry, you're not going to be able to see much on the right. Um, I'm not sure if we put this up last time. I can't recall. We did not. Oh, we did not. Okay, so we, what we wanted to do is um, just give you an idea of the, the rent structure for the project. Again, a majority of the units um, are going to be 50 to 60% of county median income. Um, so you're looking at, you know, uh, about $884 to $985 for a one um, and anywhere between, you know, $1,062 to $1,185 um, for a two-bedroom. 
And then we will have some market rate units, and really those market rate units um, will have to be not only proven out by a market study, but then have to be underwritten by many folks, including our investors and lenders. And the reason why I point that out is that we're expecting, you know, decent market rents at this property, which will, you know, really drive the operations. And so when we get asked the questions, well, who will, oper or who will live there and how will the property be operated, there's a lot of folks um, – I guess, investing in our organization that we'll be able to get these rents, keep the property well-maintained, and really drive that mixture of incomes uh, to live at the property. Um, we also were asked last time to kind of come back with some occupancy data. Uh, we were able to pull occupancy data for Monona specifically. The um, I'm sorry. Um, usually when this happens to me when I'm presenting, I just click on it and move it over. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's possible or not. Is it possible, Will, to move the Zoom box Hello. out of the way? Oh, the people? Yeah. yeah. The wizard behind the screen just shows up into the room. How does that happen? Oh, oh it's right there. <laughs> okay. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Oh. Yay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Elisa. <laughs> you, always, you always blame the intern, right? Um, <laughs> So, uh, voila, thank you. For, the, for Manoa's zip code, MGE is showing a less than 5% uh, vacancy. Uh, but we've gotten market studies um, in the past and reached out to um, Baker Tilly, who's our consultant uh, for market studies. And in the primary market area, which is, again, where you know, we would expect to draw our tenants from for this project, uh, there is a 3% vacancy in affordable housing developments and a 1% vacancy in um, market rate developments. Um, and the information that we also were able to pull from um, Baker Tilly shows that the number of extremely cost-burdened households in Monona has increased over the last 10 years. And so what that means is if you're defined as extremely um, housing cost-burdened, you're paying over 50% of your income towards uh, rents. And so that has gone up in Monona, uh, showing that there is a little bit of an affordability need in Monona. Um, and then I just wanted to point out, again, Lane talked about my background at WIDA. Um, we've done a lot of projects uh, when I was at WIDA uh, along the Beltline. Some of the most recent ones include the Royal along Broadway, Artisan Village, which is 168 units behind Novation Campus, and uh, 95 units at Taylor Place Apartments, which is a, a four-story building at the Old Babes Restaurant. Then all three of those um, are 100% full. The Royal's been open a little bit longer. Um, Taylor uh, Place Apartments opened in February, and uh, Artisan Village, I believe, opened last year. And so all of these buildings, you know, have leased up really quickly. Um, I think, again, some of the benefits are location, proximity to getting onto that belt line and getting anywhere you need to go in Dane County. Uh, but uh, there's definitely a need in Dane County overall, and um, we believe that this is a, a really good site to, to add some more, um, you know, affordable units for not only the community but for the county as well. Um, so with that, I'll be feedback and here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Thanks. Yeah. So can we yeah. now uh, get that tile? Yeah, can we now get the tile back? There we go. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank you guys again for the proposal and the deliberations and the time and effort you've put in it to date. Uh, and I also want to thank the committee for the deliberations uh, that occurred while I was absent from the meeting the last time. Uh, um, I know this is kind of a new thing. Uh, if you will. Um, um, also want to thank uh, those, those community, uh, community members that, that uh, weighed in uh, with e their public comments either by email or this evening at tonight's meeting. Um, and, uh, and with that, I'll, I'll uh, open it up to uh, committee members. Um, Rob, would you like to start? So we'll start. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, thank you for that presentation and recap of things today. Um, I appreciate it. I was not um, able to be at the last meeting, but I did um, watch that meeting um, and take in everything that was said there. So um, thanks for the recap. Um, where to start? Um, Everybody's on board with the kind of merits of the project. 
um, addressing affordable housing, um, and that's and I'm right there with everybody. Um, I was first go around. I think everybody was then too. Um, the veterans housing in last one was a great component as well. The Lutheran social services. I like it. Um, you make a compelling case for um, the walkability and some of what does this, what does this place have to offer, not what does it not offer. Um, but I have to go back and look at it and say, okay, this is this is a detached housing development. Um, it is not attached to any other housing in any way, really. Um, we have a zoning map. Um, we have a future land use map um, that identifies this as a commercial corridor. Um, this would truly be an island of housing in our in our land use map, um, which, I, you know, why do we go through the exercise of creating these maps and, and zoning? Um, it's to control um, and not control, but promote successful development. Um, for our community, and and if you look at, I'll say most zoning maps, contiguous use or adjacent uses is kind of a, a common theme. Um, it's written out as one of our goals in our in our comprehensive plans to have um, adjacent um, compatible uses next to one another. Um, it's pretty standard land use planning, um, and this would not fall into that. Um, Brian had made the comment. <coughs> Um, in the last meeting talking about, you know, like where is this done? And, you know, and you look all the way to Middleton and you pull their banner and uh, thank you for showing that because that's, that's a good example, you know. Um, and I would have to look at that more, but that's, that's a good example. But I, I went through and I did the exercise, my, you know, and, and I went through and I looked and I looked and I looked and there's that, that white building right off the belt line in John Nolan. Um, but what that does have is it's got the lake on one side and it's got the link loop and the bike path and uh, right around the corner is that uh, one owner neighborhood. Um, so I struggled to find a precedent for this sort of development in that high of a commercial corridor. And they're not, there's not a ton of them. Um, and I tend to agree with some of the comments made by many of the commissioners um, about how this would integrate into Monona. And it's really tough, and I don't want to be wishy-washy. Um, I am going to be wishy-washy. It's a spoiler, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but it's time and it's money for you and, and all involved, and I and I understand that. I'm, I'm in this world, um, but I, I really struggle with how this. It, you know what it comes down to? It comes down to is this. This project is great. Is this project, is this the right place for the project or is this a place for the project? And it seems to me it's more a place. It's not the right place necessarily. Um, and that's what I struggle with because I like what you're proposing. I like this proposal a lot better than ones we've seen in the past. Um, but I struggle with, are, are we just, Putting a dot, a yellow dot, in our land use map, and saying now this is this is residential. Um, like, should we go down to um, the Shopco site and, and put a yellow dot there down the road? And do we want housing there? Is that something we want to explore? Sure. Like, it, it opens up the question: Where are we going with with our comprehensive plan and our land use plans? And I'm not saying things can't change, but a lot of work and thought is put into those. Um, and it's not done willy-nilly. There's precedent sets um, for how cities are developed. And island residential and commercial is not a common practice. So I'm going to leave it there for now. Um, maybe I'll come back and muddy the waters more in a little bit. But um, I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth here, I know. but. Um, yeah, I'm just going to stop talking for now and listen to some other commissioners. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate you uh, stepping up to the plate first. <laughs> um, Brian? 
Sure. Um, I can go next. I do also appreciate bringing up the Urbana project. I'm not uh, familiar with that project. I am familiar with that location. Um, and I'm familiar with actually some of the housing projects that are actually were done years ago, actually, on the other side of um, where the Y is on the other side of the road, which is a very complicated um, entry and exit point. And, and I'm not sure if that was actually a wise decision by the city of Madison. Um, and I don't know the details surrounding this project, um, so I can't really comment on it, but I, I do appreciate kind of the follow the follow up on that part. Um, if I take land use and zoning out of this, this is a wonderful, well-designed, amazing project, uh, which I would love to have um, here in Monona. I, I agree, Rob, I think put it well of like, is this a spot yeah it is a spot but it's not the spot um i still struggle with that piece i think it's an amazing project it's well designed um <laughs> i have to put out there we think this is affordable this is not affordable housing guys like it might be by by the terms of litec and all those other pieces but if you look at at these rents like i'm telling you there are there are, uh, you know, two professional um, college graduate people that still would struggle paying some of these rents. So um, I don't want us to kind of walk away thinking like this is um, a significant dent in our housing issues regarding affordable housing because these, these um, numbers are, are still difficult for many of our residents and, and other residents to be able to meet. I'll leave it at that. I, I don't want to repeat myself from um, our last meeting, so I, I'd like to hear from others that weren't able to be there and then uh, be able to offer a comment beyond that. Okay, great. Thank you, Brian. Patrick, pick hey. on all the people that <laughs> weren't here first. No. Sounds good. Um, I wasn't here at the last meeting, but I want to applaud you for bringing this bold idea to Monona. Um, I have some comments and some questions, and, and I want to give those comments and questions from the perspective of someone that's actually lived in affordable in a neighborhood with affordable housing for a long time on the south side of Madison. Um, and I guess I want to ask a question. Does anyone know how many apartment units that Monona has created in the last 10 years? With the current and everything else? Uh, I don't. No, I have to tell you, do you know? Does anybody know how many apartments are at the current? We've probably created 500. Five, 500, 500, 500, 500, 600 in 10 years. How many affordable units did we create in 10 years out of those 500? Zero. Zero? Yeah. So we talk about this isn't a dent in the affordable housing issue that exists in the city and in the, 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 the county and in the state, but it is a dent. It would be the, probably the first time in 10 years that Benona did something with affordable housing. This is a great project, and it would have been great on the current site, right? Would anybody agree that this would have been a great project to have there? Mm -hmm. But it's not. It's not there. And uh, so, sure, it's isolated. But the Lake Point neighborhood is fairly isolated with a long walk to the grocery store, the Super Walmart that we talked about earlier today. Uh, that's been a pretty successful community over time. Um, and the city, the city of Madison took a great risk upon that in, in trying to redevelop that neighborhood and, and because it once was the most notorious drug infested neighborhood in the city. So I, we don't have data. I tried to get some data for police calls to that property of the, the Shell Station because I saw that in the, the commentary, but we, we don't have that data in front of us for this meeting. But I just really want to say that, that we talk a lot about diversity and inclusivity and all of these things. And here is an opportunity to perhaps do something about it in a physical and, and in a physical way, in a concrete way. Um, I think the project looks great. I think you guys put a lot of effort into this and you have a pretty great track record of building things like this. I have no doubt that the property would fill. Um, and I think we're really focusing on, there's no other houses next to it. Right? There's no other houses next to it, but um, you know, think about someone that's living in an urban environment uh, that uh, could potentially be dangerous, that could have many, many negative uh, uh, issues around it. 
coming to a place like this and having an opportunity to be in the, the, the Monona Grove School District and, and taking advantage of all the things that we have in Monona to maybe improve their lives. It's kind of hard to think about that when you haven't been there before. Uh, so I would just like to say thank you for putting this together and I think it's a great project. Thank you. Hi again. Hi. Uh, in person this time. Yes. Um, I, I, ha I, if you don't mind me kind of walking through my thoughts on this, I, Rob, I kind of feel like I might be in a, in a similar space as you in a way. I mean, this project is, is great and just, you know, we do have this, this question about land use and our comprehensive plan. So, it shows it as commercial, but then I think about, I, I read through the plan, and so I'm gonna probably pull some quotes from the plan just to help um, explain where I'm thinking. So it says that, that we need to look at market trends, we need to look at our needs and market trends, and those need to be considered and balanced when determining land uses for areas of development and redevelopment. Well, obviously, okay. Um, so this was, but this was from 2016, mm -hmm. and it's been five years, there's been no one expected a pandemic. No, I mean, there's just a lot of things that have happened in that five years. And so it made me think, okay, if we were looking at things now, would this plan still be the same? Maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't. But I don't think the plan is meant to be like this airtight, locked in thing. So we have to look at it, we have to consider it, we have to um, think about what we want as a community. But I don't know that the fact that our future land use map shows it as commercial it needs to be the only thing that we're thinking about. So then um, I was looking at the 2014 minutes from the proposal that you were talking about today and um, you know, very similar, a lot of similar things in it. So what's different this time? And so then I was looking at our vision for our community and it's, it's to be a welcoming, vibrant community where people want to be. I think we see that because we have you know, the gentleman today that was talking about his brother that wanted to move here. And so mm -hmm. they spent all that time looking. There's a lot of people that want to live here, and we know that. And we feel that because <laughs> they're looking for homes and they can't afford them. So it's a challenge right now. Um, a lot of information has been prepared on workforce housing and since our plan was adopted in 2016. And there was... Um, the gentleman, I can't remember his name, but from REMAX, talking about the, the workforce housing. Uh, the Wisconsin Realtors Association had a study that they compiled, um, and it prepared information or pulled together information about our challenges, our housing challenges. And so Dane County is one of four counties where the medium income household cannot afford the medium priced home. So that's shown it's not affordable. And rent is categorized as barely affordable. So then we look at our plan again, and it says we want to ensure the city's ability to retain and attract a talented workforce. And we want to add that residential density to support commercial areas. So we know that our business community is looking for places for their, for their workforce to live. And I also just, <laughs> so to tell a couple of little stories too, I heard about um, someone in our school district who's driving up from Rockford every day because um, he can't afford a place to live. That is, you know, that's unfortunate. <laughs> so hopefully he'll be able to get a place soon. Um, I have some other friends who are, they want to stay in the community right now. They're paying $1,700 a month. Mm -hmm. They want to stay. They're getting a house. It's $2,000 a month. I mean, it's it's just a lot. And then from my own personal experience, I just bought and sold in this market <laughs> this summer, and so it was crazy. And, um, you know, other communities are taking on this issue in different ways. Like there are communities in California, they're transitioning their single family homes into duplexes, and that's right in the middle of um, a single family neighborhood, and that's of course controversial. There's other communities that are permitting accessory dwellings in larger lots. So there needs to be some different creative ways to look at this problem. So, and then, you know, we've mentioned, you mentioned DEI, you mentioned DEI, and I think, I think that is a really important thing for us to be thinking about because this is something that we in the city, we just have a, a, ta a task force 
So does this really help us lean into that a little bit? Um, maybe. I think it does. So there is a lot of potential for additional development there too. So right next door, there are the two adjacent parcels that you mentioned that you think that they're, you know, we don't know. Maybe they're going to be developed. Maybe they're not. That's that's the hard part for me. Um, but there's also the fire station down the street. There's also the vet hospital. Those are two parcels that are empty, have been for sale. I'm not sure where they're at in that process, but there is potential in this corridor for some additional potentially mixed use. So it, it's isolated now, but will it always be? I, I doubt it. I don't know what that's going to look like, and I know our plan says it's commercial. So I'm not, I'm not really sure. If this is the, this is the hard part, you know. This is I think where Rob is struggling too. Um, so I see a lot of potential. Dane County believes in the project. Weta, you think is going to believe in the project? Um, but I do have some concerns as well. And you know, the email from Ms. Whitehorse, if if what she is experiencing right now is something that the residents in this neighborhood would experience, that would be unacceptable. You know, we don't want to have a situation where it's unsafe for the families and the community. So that's just going to take commitment, I think, to make sure that that does not happen. I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, and then I think it also is going to really take a commitment to making that connection active and real, like a real dedicated commitment to connecting it and, and maybe there's a way to do some kind of a path behind the the, the parcels to Ahuska and connecting it up eventually with the river walk and and over across the street to the current and you know up to the bike path I mean I think that's a possibility so I just think it, it's not going to happen overnight but I think it could happen and I think it's a a, a really there's a lot of potential I just you know we just have to make sure that it's done properly so thanks Madam Chair, I have one thing I just wanted to add that uh, from my perspective as a business owner I'm contacted every day by multiple real estate companies to open a another restaurant in a vacant piece of commercial uh, real estate right now and it's at least two or three times a week there's a lot of vacant commercial real real estate right now and like as you mentioned with the uh, 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 how COVID changed workforces and people are working from home and many companies aren't even are, are downsizing a lot of their their, uh, their their commercial holdings right now so I uh, I think that's something that should definitely be considered uh, the way that land use was was originally proposed how many 2016 yeah. mm -hmm. so thank you yeah I, I guess one more thing to that too I drove around today and there's a lot of commercial space open in the city right now so um, I don't know what the state of that commercial property is, but there was a lot of for lease signs up. Um, before I, before I uh, go to the rest of the committee, I should just uh, point out that um, uh, because, Corinne, you raised it, um, when Deb Whitehorse's uh, correspondence came in, which I very much appreciated, I reached out to our police chief. Mm -hmm. um, and while he couldn't, uh, couldn't provide exact data, uh, uh, on 15 minutes notice since it was right before yeah. the meeting. Um, uh, what he did say uh, is that uh, in regards to the gas station that he could he said that there's no alarming issues, which isn't to say that there is an activity that goes on there, but that the activity that goes on there is, as, as Deb pointed out herself, is very, very typical for any kind of urban Mm -hmm. uh, gas station uh, on on um, and he said it's that it's no more or less no, no more or less and if you compare it to the quick trip that's a, um, on West Broadway um, there's no comparison that the quick trip on West Broadway is a lot worse um, uh, and and that the owners of and manager of that shell station are um, very, very invested in in uh, reaching out to the police um, as needed and doing the right thing in terms of really working to clean it up. So, I think we would have a very willing partner um, in uh, you know backing up to backing up to the development. Um, so he said, you know, in summary, yes, we get calls at the shell, but it's not a gregarious quality in my opinion, nor is the nature of the calls anything that creates 
um, great concern okay. um, for him. Um, and do you think that adding more there uh, from a residential perspective would help abate that? Right, right. Hope that's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, Susan. Okay, um, I, I really appreciate your walking through your thought process, Corinne, because I have sort of similar thought processes. Um, I think, you know, Monona has a lot to offer families. That's why we all are so committed to it. And I think for us to be able to offer more families the opportunity to live here is a good thing. Um, I, I think while well, we can say it's a place, is it the place, is it the best place? I, I don't know how relevant I think that is. I think times have changed since the comprehensive plan was created. Um, and it does talk about the need for, reading from Doug's um, summary that he gave us even, the increased need for multifamily rental housing. Um, and you know, I had a lot of hesitation about the previous project for a lot of different reasons. This project is an outstanding project. Um, if we had land in the center of Monona for this project, that'd be great, but we don't and we won't. And I think we have an obligation as part of the greater Madison Dane County community to provide more affordable housing, to take a part in it. And Patrick, you're right. With none of the none of the apartments we've put up in the last several years have included affordable housing. And I just think, you know, I I think it's important for us to contribute to that effort. And I think, you know, from my school board lens, we would be thrilled to have more families experience our schools. And I think we have a lot to offer kids. And I was really happy to see you enlarge the playground <laughs> for that reason, because I am always kind of looking at kids and thinking about um, you know, what's available for them. And I think it's kind of also, who are we to say whether this is a place someone would choose to live or not? I do agree with that point. I think that's a valid concern, because I thought I walked away from the last meeting kind of going through this whole thought process myself. Um, and I talked to a friend who was very involved in um, affordable housing in Madison, and she kind of made that comment too, that yeah, I mean, you know, that there just is a need, and I think this would be a really nice place for people to be able to live. Um, you know, there are a lot of questions about the, the screening behind the shell station, that kind of thing. I, I, I think that's a good thing to work on, and the kinds of materials that'll come later. But overall, um, I, I like the project, and I, I think I, you know. I think it's a good one. I'm, I'm ready to support it because um, I, I think it adds positively to the community. And I think if we're serious about DEI efforts, we need to be serious about it. I think that's the other thing. We can't keep talking about it and not contribute and do anything about it. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Chris. Well, my, you know, my main stance really hasn't changed since last time. I think this is the definition of spot zoning and that's planning 101 you don't spot zone so that, that's an issue for me um, when we crafted the uh, zoning types the land use types it wasn't just willy-nilly we didn't sit in a table and say oh, let's put a yellow circle here and a blue one here and a red one there, there there's a lot of thought and reasons for it this is a what should I say it's a strong commercial area it's not really retail you're across from a lumber yard you're behind the gas station there are two clinics right there but it's not the area as a planner you would ever put this in so I understand what everybody's saying and I, I will say this before I go any further if the majority of the Commission supports this I will work as hard as I can to make this the best project we can you know I, I think you've put a lot of thought into it you've, you've done a lot of work here and I'm, I'm not going to be against it if the majority of the commission is for it. There are a lot of accusations tonight. I don't think this is the place to go through, but if you ever want some history on it, I'm sure Brian or Sue or I'd be happy to talk to you about what happened last time around. Um, so that being said, I, I think it's the wrong place for residential in our city. And I think it is an isolated area. I think 75 units does not make a community. I think it's a very small neighborhood. If, if it does happen, I mean, nobody's talked about your project. If you come back again, it'd probably be nice to have a few thoughts. So like I said, if, if, if the majority ends up supporting this, I will go through it with you and make it as best we can. I, a, a few thoughts I have 
on your layout. When I look at the, um, oh, we don't have anything up. You have a eastern sidewalk. I love the connectivity you've put there with all your sidewalks. Um, the far eastern one on that eastern, just short drive that goes out to Broadway. On one illustration, it looked like it stopped. Now, I'm going to assume you'll take that all the way out to Broadway. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and I believe that's, Great. Um, sorry, yeah. It just has to be mentioned. Uh, on the road you show coming in, you show the road with the sidewalk on the east side, but not the west side. I assume you know that there will have to be a west side sidewalk. Now, you may be waiting because those lots are going to need to help pay towards that or whatever. I, I don't know, but it'll need sidewalks on both sides. So if, for example, you came in and said this is our proposal, if it wasn't being put in with the road, there need to be a condition that that sidewalk goes in at the point in time that those lots get developed or something along those lines. Uh, it'd be a standard condition, but something you need to think about. Um, it's already been mentioned tonight, but uh, can you need a little more brick? Uh, I, on the main building. I think the other the, the townhomes look good. I think on the main building you've got it grounded really well, but you need to have some vertical element somewhere to tie that in with the rest of your building. Architecturally, I think that would be really helpful. And speaking of architecturally, what, what are your siding materials? It almost looks like a vertical material on some of those areas. What is it? So there, um, the brick is on the first floor, yep. um, and then the rest of the building is uh, covered with James Hardy. Uh, but Hardy's horizontal. On yeah, some of your elevations, it looks like there's some vertical in there. So we would do batten board uh, siding, and I believe it's the same materials, uh, okay. the composite siding. Okay. Um, it may not be James Hardy, but yeah, it is a, it is so. a, it's okay. going to be a composite um, uh, a siding material, not a, a, you know, a vinyl material at all. Okay. Um, I have a question for the chair. Mm -hmm. I just because I'm curious when they said the quick trip on West Broadway is worse you're talking about the one in Madison or the mm -hmm. one on Monona Drive no the one in the okay one all right I was just surprised if you're talking about the other one in Monona it's like shocked it's too busy no for there to be it <laughs> oh it is worse okay. he's saying it's, yeah okay. he's saying it's, worse. it's okay I just because yeah. I just made, made yeah. a note I'm no. like holy cow and I do agree with the comment earlier that with 75 more units here it's likely the, the security issues at this gas station would be a lot less. There's a lot more people around. When people are around, um, it's a lot harder for those issues to pop up. Uh, mm -hmm. With, with uh, Deb Whitehorse living there alone, I'm sure she's a prime target. There's not enough activity and action around there. So I, I do agree that the more people around here would probably help that for her. I think her point, though, the thing I got over her letter was isolation she felt. Now, she was a only child there as far as all right maybe there's other siblings but I mean it was very limited for her there growing up and there would be some here so there'd be some sense of community what I struggle with is a sense of community out of there I don't know that I could feel like I was part of the Monona community living there in a remote area um, landscaping our code is all stalls it doesn't matter if they're underground or in a garage or anywhere so the the reason for that is you can imagine say you propose just the building with just underground parking you say but I don't need any landscaping <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. no, it doesn't work that way so if you do that it comes to a little over 2,000 points you have over 3,000 points you are doing more landscaping appreciate that the site needs it and again when our code it's a minimum right and, and I think you've proposed a fairly good plan I would ask if you come back I don't know, Rob, if you could read it, but I can't tell what the plantings yeah. are or no, what no, they are. We'll hold the exhibit. We'll pull yeah. it so out it's just, a page. Yeah, just so some of that stuff is legible. I actually have my magnifying glass out there. I still have <laughs> I still struggle. I'm right with you. Yes, we do have magnifying glasses. <laughs> I use my cell phone and use the picture function. That's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and then, you know, I hear a lot of talk about potential for more redevelop all these areas. I'm going to throw just a little caution in the wind here about all that. Uh, we have to remember, commercial is what helps underwrite all, all the residential taxes here. And the more we take out commercial, the more it just chips away at that base and everyone else that's a residential property owner here, their taxes just go up a little bit more. So I wouldn't be quite so anxious to say, let's redevelop all of Broadway into residential. I think we still have to be careful and prudent and do it where people think it makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I'm not saying, I'm not debating whether you think it makes sense on this particular parcel. What I'm saying is I, I, I don't think we want to take all our commercial properties, keep redeveloping. 
I think we need a strong commercial base. The people that went before us did a great job with that, and hopefully we can maintain a strong commercial base in Monona. I just had to get that pitch in. That's it for me. Thank you. One word. I guess, and this is the only minor kind of negative I've had, was the whole bus issue. I don't think walking to the park and ride is realistic. I mean, I drove by there again at rush hour, and I'm thinking, oh, my God. And then it's about one and a half miles from there to the bridge road bus. You know, we all know that Monona has struggled for a long time to get any kind of contract with Madison Metro, and it doesn't seem like that's real likely in the future. So I guess I wouldn't. That point to me is not a selling point. I just don't really see it as viable. But I think the point that a lot of people likely would have cars or, you know, ride sharing, those kinds of things, and maybe there could be some thought given to that down the road, too, about hooking people up with that. Because walking along the sidewalk there I think is okay. I'm a little nervous about too many people having to cross too often, but that crossing over Stoughton Road, I just don't think that's very realistic. I appreciate you're not mentioning that was accessible to that bus stop because there's not even a sidewalk to get to the right. There isn't. That's the other piece. Once you get a little far down, there's nothing to walk on. You know, what will happen with Highway 51? We don't know. I'm sure it will be a separated grade crossing, which will maybe make it easier when it happens. I don't know. Right. Right. But, but you know, the other thing is is that I, you know, I know Madison Metro is looking at their routes mm -hmm. currently, and it seems to me that this, you know, between the Dane County being interested in this and potentially us being interested in this and Madison Siri being serious about looking at their routes, maybe it's a good time to, to you know, do some arm twisting in terms of Metro actually putting a, another stop on Broadway. Mm. That, would, that, that would be on the, on the west side, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. of, of 51. Mm -hmm. And then it would be less of an issue, yeah. you know. Um, That's about, that'd be nice. I yeah. know, I'm just yeah. not having high hopes, given the history. Patrick? Well, that's very similar to what I was going to mention. So, okay. Yeah. The regional yeah. transportation. Yeah. God forbid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Christy. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah. I'll let you in on something that's not a secret. I support this development. <laughs> I think it's uh, I think it's such a solid plan. Um, you know, it, we did something very similar when we developed the Trace to now Yahara Terrace property. Right, it was all trailer homes. There were no other homes near it. It's surrounded by commercial and a park. Very similar setting, um, and that catalyzed and probably helped bring the current to fruition. You know, all of that other development. Um, so. Um, I think uh, the connectivity issues I just don't understand because I see bike lanes, I see sidewalks, I see parks, I see thousands of jobs, clinics, financial institutions, stores, restaurants. There's really nothing that, I mean, maybe there's not a hotel. Well, there is. <laughs> I'm trying to think of something that's not there. A funeral home. You'd have to come up Monona Drive. Okay, that's like the only business I can think of that's not there. Um, and Mr. DeFula just pointed out this could be a potentially f amazing future site for a B-cycle station. Um, I, when I worked in Fitchburg, I helped you know figure out what, what you know what makes a great site for a B-cycle station. It's something like this. Um, so you know, oh, and there's also a public school now within walking distance. So I mean, I just I think it just makes a lot of sense. Um, we have an opportunity to provide housing and dignity to people through high quality development that they currently do not have. And I know in my day job, I serve all, 99% of the people I serve are low income. The other 1% are disabled. Um, and to think that they could have underground parking um, where they could store a bicycle safely and so that they're not in their living room or in their bedrooms. I mean, that's, that's huge. And then also knowing they have possibly water access. I mean, that's incredible. And I know when I've talked with Rutabaga, they've, you know, they're always trying to overcome how do we get our industry to see people of color using kayaks and canoeing and watercraft, you know? Well, it's because no developments are near the water, you know, that, that they can afford. And so this is, you know, and I haven't walked the property yet, but it's from the aerial maps, it looks like there's a tributary right there where someone could plunk in a little fishing kayak 
or a fishing boat. So, you know, if this goes forward, I definitely encourage you to think about a, a kayak raft or a canoe raft. That could be a fantastic asset. Um, I agree that um, Deb Whitehorse, if she has more, and we activate this space more, she's going to have a much better experience being there and, and won't have that isolation. Um, you know, I, I just, I strongly feel that Monona has not been pulling our weight as far as a community, a suburb in the Madison region in affordable housing. I mean, that is a fact. You know, if we've been putting in all these uh, market rate apartments, but we haven't contributed and done our fair share of affordable housing that's quality and um, in a great location, I, you know, I, I think I, I want to be uh, uh, serving a community that is more inclusive like that and that we are doing our fair share. Because I hear those comments a lot and it's it's a hard one to argue against. Um, so, yeah, and thank you for bringing this forward to Manona. Thank you. Um, so I just have a couple of things I wanted to say, um, which is uh, I, uh, Chris, I just want to say I completely understand when you say, you know, uh, to, 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 since I was not here, um, the previous development, um, and and I know how much work goes into comprehensive plans because I do it for a living as a consultant with organizations. Um, uh, not city plans per se, but I certainly know what that kind of planning involves, and I'm, I have no doubt that um, it was well thought out, um, and uh, the, that um, you know that that um, everybody put their best expertise and and uh, work into it. Um, you know that being say that being said, is uh, Bob Dylan would say that I think the times they are changing. Um, and, you know, when I think about residential and I think about developments like this, I also think about the fact that, you know, not everybody, number one, wants to live by the library, and that's not a slight on our library. Um, but it, not, not to mention the fact that not everybody can afford it. You know, when people talk about, oh, well, everybody, you know, residential is over by the library and they should be close to the library and the pool. Again, I, you know, I, um, and, and, and I guess I, I, I really just try to step back um, from what is my white privileged, rather Mayberry background, um, you know, to recognize that just the choices of how we define what successful and development looks like in our community and how we define what's the best place for residential um, um, is all by our design um, and and I'm I, and I'm just mindful of something that you know I remember Harry Hawkins from Nehemiah saying um, you know, in the very beginning of our work with Nehemiah, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, the expectation, the assumption um, when people worked with him was that it was his responsibility to assimilate to our way of being, to our way of thinking. Um, like that was his, you know, and it reminds me, you know, as a woman, it certainly reminds me of, uh, you know, just as a woman, I might be expected to embrace or assimilate into a man's way of being or a man's way of doing business. Um, and so I just think it's important for us to recognize that, you know, not everybody would be comfortable living at the library or want to live at the library and, and um, never mind that they couldn't afford it. Um, and, and Minota does need affordable housing. Um, uh, and so I think, you know, and I can remember too, you know, we talked about some of the developments that we've done. And, you know, I can remember two discussions around, you know, why are we putting up so many apartments? You know, this is all about single family. Again, our definition of a successful development 10 years ago was single family. You know, everybody should own. Or, or condos, everybody should own. And so that when we started talking about apartments, everybody was kind of scratching their heads thinking, you know, why, you know, that's another huge change, right? Um, uh, you know, why, and same thing with mixed use, you know, um, mixed use developments, you know, again, relatively 
compared to some of, of our you know other options you know is a relatively new thinking around in urban uh, in urban development you know um, the whole idea that that you would have retail under every single uh, you know, um, living facility. So, and that that's something that people would desire. I mean, Patrick, I think you just mentioned the, the transportation. I mentioned the transportation study, um, regional work that's being done. And you know, one of the top things that people spoke about in that study was the wanting to have amenities within walking distance. All kinds of amenities is a top priority of, of people that lived um, uh, that, that live in this area and this region. So. I just, you know, I just think, um, and I do think that it will spur um, other development along this stretch, you know, um, a stretch that admittedly needs more development. So, um, so I just, you know, again, uh, you know, I just want to encourage everybody to think about that, and uh, as I have and continue thinking about it, and, um, but I, you know, um, I'm impressed uh, with the with the quality um, and the objective of the proposal. Um, obviously, as everybody said, it's a fantastic development in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I, when I opened up the drawings, I was like, "Holy crap! I'd like to live there." <laughs> you know, um, and and by the way, there are lots. I mean, maybe it's a little more on the west side, but there are. You know, I don't have to tell you that there are lots of residential developments that have a gas station that that, that, that butt up against a gas station. Um, you know, that's not unusual um, at all. So, uh, anyway, I, I, you know, I'm certainly uh, I'm certainly in support of it. And as Susan said, if we're if we're Curious about it, I think, um, you know, which I know we are as a city, I think, um, you know, we have to try. Um, and we have to stretch and think about what's possible. And, and as several people have said, I, you know, it's not like we have a bunch of other parcels sitting around waiting for affordable housing. I mean, we just don't have a lot of options. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I do think that times are also changing as it relates to, as everybody's already talked about, as it relates to COVID. I mean, I think the whole idea of commercial um, uh, and office space and all of that is going to be completely turned on its head because um, uh, I think it's it's really going to have an impact. So, you know, uh, it's hard for me to imagine, honestly, um, you know, the Whitehorse family is property owners sitting another umpteen years hoping that some residential developers gonna be that's gonna come along and um and you know, it's just hard for me to imagine. Um that that you know, that that's real likely in any time in the near future. Certainly not in um father's future. So uh so, um, any other comments? Thoughts? Yeah, I have one. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say, I you know, I was shocked the other day. I was driving on Stoughton Road by Flom, and I saw herds of high school kids coming from La Follette walking across Stoughton Road going to Wendy's. Um, I was really surprised oh, yeah. to see that. <laughs> so, have you seen that? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes, it was kind of like Flagger, you know, um, and so, you know, <laughs> Madison and... Wow, well, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So they're... The fearless, invincible people, right? <laughs> um, but I think, um, you know, the state of Wisconsin and the city of Madison has been talking about doing Stoughton Road for so long that, you know, Maybe maybe one more development will will push them to make that move, you know, because it is such a problem over there, um, and it really does need to be addressed. I know the last time I talked with the city of Madison about their iteration for that corridor, they were going to look at something like East Town, um, East Washington, so a boulevard style um, development. So yeah, or you know, corridor. So something really different, and we don't know what that'll hold, but. Um, I personally think most of your people will would walk your residents would walk toward Monona versus over to that bus stop. I, I just don't see that being frequent use. Can I I 
know if this is out of order. Can I say one thing? Oh, sorry. Um, Chris, hang um, on one second. Yep. Like the applicants, I've been sitting here counting votes, and, and it looks like the will of the Planning Commission will be for this to move forward. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to ask some procedural questions, because I saw your aggressive schedule, and this, <laughs> no this is a GDP PIP <laughs> process, correct? Yeah. And you're aware that a GDP PIP, the GDP has to come here once we see it, we only make a recommendation to the council and then the council has to approve it and they need two readings. And the PIP then, the same process where it comes through here. And, and you have a lot of information here. You have more information than a GDP would really require, but it's good because we can vet some of these issues and talk about them in the process and you have a better expectation of what, what we're looking at, mm -hmm. right? But time-wise, that's, that's, there, there's a lot of weeks involved. Yeah, in well, so, yeah, but I was also going to say that I, that I believe uh, my understanding is that you, you two have already connected, which is to say Sean and Doug have already connected in terms of what you need specifically as much as what we need, but also what you need for uh, by your mm -hmm. deadline. That's correct. Which may be a little bit different or lighter or different than what, what we may be talking about. Yeah, so. specifically, we, we would not need the PIP approval. This is GDP? Yeah, so we would come back probably in April um, with okay. the final design uh, for, for that effort. We've been awarded GDP by when? So the GDP has to be done in, this, in December. Okay, well, there's time for that. That I, I, I'm better. not trying to push you. I'm just, I mean, I want it to be thoughtful, but I it's just yeah, like we, the we talk schedule realized. to get PIP done by then would be a lot. No, no. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, our preferred route is to go uh, just to GDP, get the permissive zoning in place. Um, and that's why we also show the 3D renderings now and the landscape plan so that when we bring it back, there's not a lot of surprise right. in so. GDP is not permits. GDP right. is yep. an approved general development plan. Mm -hmm. So the concept's approved and taken down, and as long as you substantially conform to that, then you're good. Correct. Okay. Yes. Blood pressure back down to normal there? I'm sorry? <laughs> is your blood pressure back down to normal? Well, yeah, when about I saw that schedule up there, I'm thinking <laughs> there's no way you can make, yeah. meet that anyway. Yeah. Yeah, we, we only need the GDP approval for the application. Okay. Great. So... Um, Rob has his hand up. Hmm? Rob has his hand up. Oh, sorry. Yep. Uh, Rob. All right, I'll be brief here, but I just wanted to kind of have one last closing statement. Um, first of all, I want to thank the commissioners for their comments. Um, I appreciate those genuinely because they all come from different perspectives. Um, Patrick, I love you calling us out. Like, like the affordable housing, we need to do better. Um, that said, <laughs> I like Chris's comment. This is spot zoning. I think we should be very careful with that. I also agree with other with Chris's other comment. I think um, it kind of it resonates with me because I think all of the things we pointed out about the problems with this site and this being, I think this is just a site and, and we can address affordable housing in Monona because we have it right here, right now, and that's the site we have. And I think that's it, it, maybe that's what we need. Maybe that's exactly what we need. Um, it's not perfect, but it's what we have. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone for their comments because it kind of, you know, takes my own thoughts to some degree um, and helps inform me from different perspectives. So, um, and I was getting back to Chris's comment. It's this, you know, this is something the commission is going to support and I'm going to support. I'm not saying I'm not. Um, like, I do want it to be a really good project. It's not, I'm against it, or I'm for it 100%. It's not like that. I think it's get that cut and dry. And then moving forward, kind of the, the processes going forward, um, you know, I looked at the plan to some degree, and to a, to a to point to know that I think it's a good plan. I haven't dug into it, um, and I haven't, and I, I'm not really prepared to give detailed comments about site layout and landscape plans. Um, if I was to get one, it would just be um, try to use native plants. Um, it's not too difficult to use mostly all natives instead of adaptive plants. Um, but like I stated before, I think it's a great project, um, and I hope it's wildly successful. So that's all. I'll be quiet now. Thanks, Rob. I appreciate it. Not you being quiet. You saying something. <laughs> <laughs> I'll mute myself. 
Okay. Uh, anything else? I, and I am, and actually, I'm gonna, uh, I am gonna make an exception to the rule. If you'd like to say something, go ahead. Okay. It's, it's, as far as the commercial, if you actually could step up to the mic again, that would be great. I know this is breaking the rules, but it's a free hearing. Um, as far as the commercial part of it goes, we haven't had offers really too much for the commercial. Mm -hmm. And like with the COVID thing, things have changed on how people work. Right. And I'm thinking a lot of these big businesses are probably shutting down or finding smaller places to move their people mm -hmm. um, because people can work at home. But we did have talks, I think, years ago with Bergstrom Auto. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about commercial, mm -hmm. they were interested, but they were turned down mm -hmm. by the committee or commission. Mm -hmm. So Bergstrom? We never had Bergstrom here. Um, I All don't right. know, but that. I've been here a long time. We never had Bergstrom. But that, that was. Maybe it didn't get that far. No. Mm -hmm. it, I might not have made it right to the okay, meeting. You said this committee. This well, committee never saw it first. Okay, right. then maybe it was through. Maybe it was the mayor. It could right. have been at that right. time. Right. In fact, probably, I think so. Okay. It was, I don't remember the mayor at the time. So, anyways, but thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I am not sure if it's now or request for staff. I had some questions for Doug, but it's relevant to this, but I think I'll wait till the end. I'll wait till the end. Okay. Great. Um, well, unless there are any other comments related to this pre-hearing, I will officially close uh, the pre-hearing. Um, and uh, you guys, I want to thank you very much again for coming. and. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing you back sooner rather than yeah. later. Okay, right? Thank you. Right. Uh, again, want to thank uh, the whole committee's uh, deliberations around this. I know it's um, I know it's we're stretching in some uh, stretching is always a little difficult, fun, difficult. Mm. Um, um, uh, with that, I'm going to suggest we move to reports of staff and commission members. Staff report. Thank you. So first off, with the economic development update, um, we just today had our uh, second of the Main Street bounce back uh, grant applications come through. Um, I need to review it fully, but it, it looks like another uh, promising application, and so that would potentially be the, the second um, that's taken advantage of that COVID relief. Uh, just as a reminder, that is um, occupying a uh, previously vacant storefront, either expanding um, the business or moving into a new premise um, from, from an existing upgrading uh, from the space, basically. Uh, so good things to, to see there. Um, as far as upcoming plan commission items go, uh, I'm expecting a couple zoning permits uh, that may well have come through later today um, in terms of smaller um, occupancies, things like that, from a period of vacancy. I've, I've got a couple uh, of those, one over at River Place, and something on Monona Drive that, that may well, um, I was expecting to, to come through. For the November 8th meeting, um, I just received the items for Chipotle, for the um, 6501 Monona Drive. Um, that would be both the, the zoning permit and the CSM. Um, it did already, the CSM already went through the Public Works uh, Committee. Um, and they, they know they would need to go to council, um, but I think there, there are some obvious efficiencies from bringing both through um, at, at the same time. Uh, Question, Doug, on that. So if they come through for a zoning permit, then I assume the zoning permit would be conditional on the um, completed and recorded CSM? That's my expectation, okay. yes. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, uh, One City Schools. Um, the, a couple of the um, items within the um, zoning permit conditions of approval uh, did have November um, review um, for, for a few of those items, uh, including, uh, I believe, the site circulation, the traffic circle, things like that, uh, and that targeting the November 22nd meeting. Um, so that is on the, um, on the radar as well um, as, as moving forward. That's it for me. 
I don't think that's enough. Okay. Any planning commission requests for information from city staff? Yeah. I. So when I was looking at the comprehensive plan, there's the whole section with all the um, housing information from the last census, and I was just wondering if we have the new, I don't know if we have the new census data or not, but it would be nice to get some of those tables updated just for us to look at. Um, I don't know what pages they were, but you know, just where it talks about um, like our inventory and our vacancy rates and just some of that information that's in our comprehensive plan. I don't know if that's feasible. And then there was the question about how many apartments have been built in the last decade. That would actually, I don't know if we can get that number, but that would be really helpful, um, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think if there's anything else like that that would be helpful as where we we're, you know, potentially have some other projects coming in mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this might be good background information for us that's more updated. Uh, absolutely, I'd, I'd okay. be happy to do that. I 100% agree with that because we're making a lot of decisions based on what we think and it would be nice to have the data. And we did do this once when Sonia was here and she put together a lot of information about single family households, how many single families are rental and ownership, uh, number of rental apartments, number of condos. I mean, it's, it, to have the whole data about what, what is Monona. Because we get a lot of data about here's what Dane County is and here's what Madison is and this is what we need. but. We're Monona, and, and we need to know. I agree. We're we need special. to know what is Monona. <laughs> no, what what are we, and what do we need, and what are we short of? And that data mm -hmm. would be wonderful to have for mm -hmm. that. Yes, I, I can do that. Uh, a lot of those uh, more granular pieces are actually not from the decennial census, but they're from a different data set. Right. Um, okay. I'd certainly be happy. Um, I I reference those. Um, it's an easy way to get number of household units, and there's. There's more of a margin for error because they're estimates rather than full inventories. Um, but I'd, I'd be happy to to do those and maybe put together um, <coughs> some sort of housing one pager or something like a couple, couple pages probably um, mm -hmm. with this information um, that the commission can reference. But um, also, you know, anybody else can access on on our website too. That would be great. I think there'll be interest in it. I yeah. think it'd be great, and I think if when you're doing it, if we can get some reference to what other communities our size and adjacent to us are like too, just to know where are we compared to other communities. We talk about all this, and we don't really know. We all hear anecdotal evidence from the different people we see, but it would be nice to have a whole picture of it. Mm -hmm. I was going to just say I did inquire recently for the full census data, and it's not here entirely. We're getting pieces of it okay. right now. Um, but we are at uh, we are now over eight thousand population eighty one sixty one uh, with I believe it's six thousand eight hundred and fifty eight uh, voters in the yeah, city of Manila. Wow! So when I went to, when I went to school here, in, I mean way back school, it was ten thousand people. Yes, I remember seeing those numbers. Yeah, I saw that too. But so we've creeped yeah. over eight thousand, so we're yeah. we're getting back up there. So that's pretty exciting. It would be interesting to see the demographic shake out. So yeah. see what that looks like. Any other? A lot bigger families. So. <laughs> I would just, um, I, I would just yes. mention that um, I reached out to uh, Aaron of McCann Construction at the end of the week uh, because I, uh, you know, that big building that we've been working on since, what, 2008? <laughs> uh, it, it is uh, closer to done than you think. <laughs> Um, and in fact, he said he, they expect to be moving the third floor is nearly complete, or the, la the upper floor is nearly complete. You might have a better idea because you probably tour it more often than I do, Chris. But in any case, I reached out to him and asked him if, if uh, he could give us some dates for uh, for the city council and the planning commission and CBA to to take a tour because they're expecting to move people in before the end of the year. Oh wow. Pretty amazing. Yeah, it's really amazing. Consider material shortages. Last I heard, they didn't have any countertops yet. But right, that's a lot of countertops to put in. <laughs> right, right. Um, okay, uh, so I'll, I'll keep you posted when I hear back from Aaron. Um, uh, but it's exciting. Uh, we're finally getting there, and I just can't. I, every time I go over there, I'm just blown away at the buzz. Which is to say, that whole area is just jamming all the time. Bucking Honeys is always going crazy. Forge Kitchens always going crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. 
Hmm? I was there tonight. It was nice and busy. Yeah, I mean, the tasting room, um, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not a cigar person, but I do like sitting on their patio and you have to go through. <laughs> and, uh, and I love that they're so flexible about eating other people's food <laughs> on their patio. So anyway, um, it'd be great to, to be wrapping that. Um, with that, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. We do have the uh, updates on DEI. Oh, sorry. Where, where was it? No, oh, three. sorry. It was in the middle of the, yeah. Uh, any updates on DEI? I wanted to just take a moment to say happy Indigenous Peoples Day and thank all of the people. We had an amazing ceremony this morning in the parking lot of City Hall with probably close to 50 residents and people from the county present um, and representatives from the Ho-Chunk Nation that helped. They rose the flag today and it was just Whew, it was a goosebump moment, um, really a special special event. Um, so thank you to everybody for being there. And uh, yeah, it was just, it was just great. I'm, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm speechless, I'm speechless on it. Especially given the pouring rain. Yeah, yeah. it was raining too. <laughs> yeah. 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 Imagine yeah. if it had been and sunny. Have, and have everyone just stand there like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. If it had been it's sunny, we probably nice. wouldn't need to build a new parking lot, right? Mm -hmm. Bigger parking lot. <laughs> great. Um, Anything else? Okay. With that, I now entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll move to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, Rob.